Hello, I'm Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple, and remember, as always, if you like what you see, please remember to leave a thumbs up and comment on the video to let me know what you think about the review, the game, and anything else that I mention. I always want to engage with you, and to do so in the comments gives me a lot of joy. Don't forget that if you want to help support the channel, the Patreon is always running if you want to donate a little bit each month just to keep the channel ticking over. So today I'm looking at Glass Road and talk about an anticipated game for something that came out in 2013. People have really wanted me to get on board with this review. Why? Why am I even looking at a game this old in a detail format? Well, firstly, because this is a recent reprint from Capstone Games and Furland, but also because I have a little bit of a history with this one, which I needed a full review to really explain, rather than just an express review. But this was definitely anticipated, and certainly I was keen to get back into it. What kind of happened, a long story short, was that when I first played this back in 2014, I'd only been getting into board games for about a year or two at that point, like properly blogging and everything, and I don't remember liking it. I had a few negative things to say about it, I thought it was overrated, and it's like, well, why on earth do I like this game? Why would I like it? But nowadays, I've kind of gone back to it every now and again, it's like, maybe it's not as bad as I thought. And with this new reprint, which is essentially the same game, there's no major rules changes or anything like that, in fact I'm not even aware there's any change whatsoever, I'm pretty certain it's the same as the second edition, it's just more widely available now, I thought, you know what, tastes change, people change. Everybody can change! You, your taste in games evolve, and nowadays I am playing a lot more heavy Euros than I probably used to when I started off board gaming. So maybe some aspects of this game that I disliked, I wouldn't dislike anymore now. And also, when I did play it before, I didn't review it at the time, it was just I think I played it a few times as a four-player game. And, well, we'll get onto that in more detail later, but now I have a chance to play it at all the player counts. Maybe it just didn't work for me at four. You know, maybe it was better with less. We shall see. So I'm now going to give this one its fair shout. I've played it a ton recently. It's about time to give it a fair, detailed review. In Glass Road, you will produce glass over four building periods. Aside from glass, you will need to also produce bricks and collect wood and clay to build buildings. Only the value of your buildings will determine your final score and whether you will win the game or not. So this is incredibly important. To accomplish this task, you will need the help of a variety of specialists. When choosing your specialist, you are trying to anticipate which ones your opponents will choose to use your own more effectively. The game goes through four building periods, each consisting of three card rounds. At the beginning of each period, you secretly choose five out of the 15 specialists that are available to all players, with no differentiation between players. Over the course of three card rounds, you will then pick a card from your hand and place it face down in front of you and reveal them one by one and resolve them immediately. The idea is that if you reveal your card and someone else has that card still remaining in their hand, they must play it. And because you have duplicated another player, you only get to perform one of the two actions present on the card. If you are fortunate enough that the card was played with no duplication, you get to perform both actions on the specialist card. Your resources are tracked via two production wheels at the side of your board. As you gain and spend resources, these are tracked appropriately, but when certain spaces are left empty, the wheel automatically rotates in order to produce glass and brick, whether you want it to or not. So yes, it's great that you are making these rare resources, but sometimes it diminishes the other resources you have at a point when you don't want them to. So you need to forward plan when you need glass and brick and when you don't. The specialists cover a wide variety of tasks. You can build buildings, you can collect resources, you can add ponds, forests and mines to your board which in themselves can generate resources. There's a lot of variety among the specialists and choosing these is paramount. There are a lot of different buildings that you can make from production buildings that allow you to turn X into Y much like other resource management games, ones that give you immediate bonuses and ones that focus more on end game scoring. At the end of four building periods, you total up all the victory points present on your buildings alone, and of course, the one with the most. Of course! Now, for the sake of this video, I had to re-record most of it because the autofocus decided to have an epileptic fit while I was recording last time, and so it became unusable. So, different top, different day, continuity be damned. Everybody got that? With regards to duration, Glass Road actually 
does a good job depending on the player count. This is very heavily dependent on player count here. With four players, this game drags on way too long for my liking. But up to three, it does a pretty good job, except that this one does have one critical issue with its time length. The setup is actually pretty quick. You've got a bunch of different tiles and you basically just put them all in a big stash. You put a few buildings out and you dish out everybody's cards. That's it. Very quick setup. Even the takedown's pretty quick. Where this game drags on a bit though is anybody's potential for AP is exasperated with this game. It really does go nuts, particularly in four players. Because you have to pick five out of these 15 cards before the game starts each round, and that's a lot of choices you have. Five out of 15. And you've got to consider what all the other players are doing and what you're going to play because you're not going to necessarily play all five of those cards. It's a bit of a decision to make and with four of you, or anybody who's remotely AP prone, hoo-wee, this game extends to a big length. Now, playing solo, you can get this game done in about an hour and it's nice and quick. Two players should also be able to crank this game out in about 60 minutes if they know what they're doing. Three players are kind of looking at around 90, Four players, though, is very volatile. It can take 90 minutes, it can take two hours. I've even had one take longer than that because of players just being super, super slow. Now, granted, that's not the game's fault, that's more players' fault. But still, you're gonna have to bear that in mind, that with a lot more players, with like ones who aren't used to this type of game, it is going to drag the game out. And there's quite a bit of downtime as well when they're deciding on the cards. If you've already figured out the five you're doing, you got nothing to do until they've hurried up and finished their five. Now granted, you could set a timer in the game, but that just introduces undue pressure, and it's not part of the game rules to introduce said timer. Now thankfully for ease of play, this is actually a pretty straightforward game to learn. I mean, most of the iconography is very intuitive. The only part of this rulebook that you might need to read twice, and that's not necessarily because the rulebook words it badly, it's just because it's the focus point in the game, and if you get it wrong, you'll break the game, is the section about how the card selection part works. There's a good example in the book where it basically shows you how a particular round will go, and you need to read it, and read it again, and read it again, because you need to have that that ingrained into your skull before you start teaching this to other players. But there's a decent amount of pictorial representation in here as well as a bunch of text as there always is, but some of it is fluff, some of it is credits, and of course being in the Ray Rosenberg game, yeah. Reference tables. This guy loves reference tables, but you kind of need this because every single building and card is explained in accurate detail here and you should have no reason to question what on earth a building means. Honestly, this game won't take most people long to get into. The iconography, as I said, intuitive. It's clear what is a conversion building, what is a one-off bonus, what is endgame scoring, how X turns into Y. It's really, really straightforward in that respect. That being said, as I mentioned with the proneness to analysis paralysis, the first game is going to be a bit of a learning experience. You don't really know from those 15 cards which ones are going to necessarily help you with what, and certainly you're trying to think, oh god, what were the opponents going to pick? Well, I don't know, it's all our first game. I assume they'll pick this? I don't know. So the first game might be a little bit of a roller coaster ride in terms of getting used to the system. But once you've got used to it once, you should be pretty comfortable from there on out. And honestly, we've had games like Fields of Arl, Caverna, uh, you know, Agricola, and all these uh, Feast of Odin. You know, all these really complex Uri Rosenberg style games with a ton of rules and a ton of pieces. Here, you've got a fair amount of pieces, but it's kind of refreshing to have a farming game that's not quite so brain burning in that respect. Though, believe me, you're still going to need to burn your brain a little bit in order to understand what cards you need to play, which ones should I play for, you know, the ones that I want to play for two actions, hopefully, and the ones that I'm hoping I'll play as a bonus. There's quite a lot to get your head around, and it does feel very unique compared to a lot of his other games, which I think was the biggest hurdle for some people I taught it to. They're used to the farming aspect, they're used to this kind of thing of, oh, I build my little uh, thing in front of me and I get resources and turn X into Y, but the concept of the cards is relatively new for most, and that's what I found was the biggest hurdle, but as I say, not a particularly big hurdle, and once you've conquered it once, you're pretty set from then on. Now for tactics and strategy, this is where we need to go back to what I was saying before about my initial impressions of this game and what I mentioned in duration about the different player counts. When I played this before, I really didn't enjoy it with four players. I found it was just too chaotic with that card system. 
and I'm a little bit more forgiving of it now, but I still don't really want to play this with four that much. It is a bit too chaotic. Bear it in mind, you're trying to think, right, hang on, I've got to play this card hopefully to get two actions. Right, this is the one I want to play. When do I play it? I've got three cards to play. Do I play it early or later? But then you're also thinking, well, I reckon you're going to take one of those cards. So I'll play this as a bonus card, hoping that you'll play it and then I'll just play it for one action. It messes you up a bit and I get the one thing I want from it. That is really cool in terms of the brain burning thinking that you've got to do in this game. And it's probably a really fun aspect. But imagine this. With two of you, you've only got to get into one person's head. With four of you, three people? That's a tall order. And a lot of the times when you're playing the cards, it can just feel very random and chaotic. It's almost a bit of a crapshoot. You know, you basically just shuffle up your 15 cards, deal five out, and chances are half of them will get through and half of them won't. It just went one step too far, I feel. Not to mention all the analysis process and the duration of the game is affected when you have four. That being said though, when I played this with three, two, and solo, the game kind of just clicked. It's a bit like a thermostat control. You turn it, you turn it, and you realize nothing's happening until it clicks, and then it switches on. The game does that for me when you descend in player count. With three players, there's enough interaction with other people, but not quite as much chaos as four player. So three player works quite well. This game shines as a two player though. Just one opponent. What is my opponent doing? What am I, you know, what are you doing? Uh, I reckon you're gonna play the uh, the uh, pond person. I don't know, I can't forget what their names are, but you know, I'm gonna play the, I'm gonna play the food merchant or something. You know, I'm gonna play that. I reckon you won't play it. And it just shines so quick, so nippy, but yet that classic feeling of get into your opponent's head, which is what I like to do in a lot of these Euro games. Playing the solo is also good fun as well. You essentially choose which roles you want, shuffle them up, and depending on which order they come out, you either get one action, two actions, or no actions at all. So it half simulates kind of the four player aspect of the game, which feels a little chaotic, but it's essentially a do your best in points side you know there's no end game goal or anything the solo mode is just get the most points and points are tight in this game so sometimes you can feel that you only did badly because the cards kind of sucked for you that is a bit of a negative but it's still relatively quick to get a solo game out and you still get that cool feeling of I'm building up my little farm in front of me which is definitely the best aspect of this game I get to build my little farm with all these cool characters and work out this puzzle of how to mitigate those two rondelles because they can stab you in the back when you least expect it if you're not careful. In the multiplayer game, you'll be playing like the cards to get the resource and you'll think, yes, now I can make two glass. Oh wait, that means I ain't got much clay anymore or any wood. Uh, I kind of needed that wood for that building. I don't want to make any glass. Uh, maybe if I keep the food marker on the back so that the wheel can't push past it, it acts as a bit of a stop gap. It sounds mechanical as all well. get out and it kind of is. I mean, why do I have to suddenly make glass just because I have the resources to do it? Thematically, that's kind of weird. But it's a cool puzzle because you're automatically trying to think, well, at some point I'm going to need glass and brick. But not just yet. Can I delay things a bit before I need it? Right, do I need it now? Great, fine. Move the markers, make some glass, make some brick, buy that building, and then build yourself back up again with whatever little engine you've created. Deciding whether you're going to have a bunch of buildings with conversion abilities or focus on one or two of those different terrain types is also a factor. You know, the gold ones, the mine, sorry, will get you gold and various other things, but then you also think, well, the pond will get me food and water, I kind of need that. But then the woodland areas gets me wood. Do I have a couple of them? Do I get a ton of them? If I get a ton of them, I'll get a ton of wood. But then I telegraph to every other player in the game that I'm probably going to pick the woodsman on a regular basis. So there's multiple things you've got to consider when picking cards and deciding on your strategy. And there's a decent amount of strategies to pursue here. The score is very tight. You're talking, what, between 15 to 25 points as a typical score in this game. You only add up the buildings. Every point matters, which is something I like. It's refreshing to not have to score 250 million points where gaining three points for something means nothing. No, no, no. If you gain even half a point for something in this game, it's relevant. You cannot overlook it. But the idea of which ones do I go for, I've had strategies where I focused on collecting a ton of food and having that by the end, having a bunch of buildings that all incorporated glass by replacing my starting buildings with these upgraded versions and just collecting a bunch of the rare resources. There's a lot of different ways to get bonus, there's a lot of different ways to score points, it just depends on which buildings come out. It's really a solid experience and definitely one I appreciated more when I played it with less than four players.
Production quality here and artwork really solid. I mean this hasn't changed much from the second edition and the cards you're probably going to want to sleeve these because people are going to be utilizing those 15 cards on a regular basis, mixing them together, displaying them. Yeah, you're going to want those sleeves in order to protect those. But the tiles, thick, good quality, lovely colorful artwork, the even little Easter eggs that you can find on some of them. It really pops on your little 5x4 grid or whatever it is. But on top of that, those two Rondell wheels, oof, they could have made or break this game for me because I have played with horrific Rondell wheels in the past. <laughs> Barrage. <laughs> But, you know, these ones are great. They're sturdy. They're not flimsy. They don't just shake about and fall out of place just by literally nudging the board. It, they're quite stiff. You have to put effort into turning them, which is good. You want it to be secure. But the little markers, even though if you've got a ton of them on one space, aren't going to fit on a single segment, that's a rare occasion. Most of the time, you'll be able to tell what's what. They're color-coded anyway. You've got to put stickers on them, yes. <sighs> stickers. But once you've got that out of the way, you're good. So, you know, cool Rondell wheels, very good production there, great tiles, good artwork, solid cards, just probably need to put a few sleeves on them, but you can do it with one pack of sleeve kings, so it's not like you've got to sleeve very much. All in all, it's a really solid production, better than some of the others, I think. Now even though the theme of building that little farm in front of you and all that is really cool, and that's one of my favorite things I like about these Uri Rosenberg games, it's still quite a mechanical affair. The idea that when you turn these Rondell wheels you have to make the glass and brick the second you can, that's kind of weird. I mean, you'd think you could stockpile a few resources and decide not to make glass and brick at a moment's notice, but I don't know, apparently demand is that high. In terms of everything else, it, the buildings do what you expect them to do. I mean, if one of them is the butcher, oh look, it turns this into food. Gee, I think. You know, it's not like this is a complete mechanical game with no theme whatsoever, but the selection of 5 out of 15 specialists, I mean, you could argue that maybe because the specialist has to go to multiple farms, they haven't got as much time to spend with you. That's a pretty good way to understand the theme of the cards. But otherwise, it's like most Uri Rosenberg games. You're building a little farm in front of you, it's your farm, not the opponent's, and that's fun enough for me in terms of thematic integration. I think farming is a theme that is just really cool. I like it. Maybe that's because I'm from the West Country. Maybe that's got an aspect to it. I, ain't got a brand new combine harvester and I'll give you the key. I like it. It works fine here. It's not going to be quite as thematic as, say, a Agricola or, to a lesser extent, Caverna. Those two, or even Fields of Isle, I guess. You know, those big mammoth games where you can do everything in the kitchen sink but yeah, I think this one works better than most others, and we're certainly not going fully abstract like something like Patchwork. Longevity is kind of in the middle, but it's decent. There's a lot of different paths to victory that you can go for in this game, and that usually depends on what buildings come out. But not a lot of buildings come out in this game. You only put four out, typically. Well, you put out more in a four-player game, but you're talking four to five in each row. There's a considerable amount of buildings that you don't see in each game, so you're definitely going to get some variety there. And of course, the combinations of what buildings come out at what time is going to influence whether you'll go for some as a particular strategy. There could be a one-off bonus for a ton of clay that you just need at that moment's notice, but then like me in the last game, you find a couple of buildings that go, well, I'm getting a lot of points for food, and these two are going to make a lot of food. You know what? There's my strategy. I'm going to gun for those buildings. There's definitely enough variety there. And if you want to play it solo, the solo mode is good. It's not groundbreaking. It's not like there's an AI system or a particular goal you're going for. It's just a point trial at the end of the day. But it's very simple. It literally uses one tiny little tile to remind you of how many cards you've drawn around. And that's kind of it. You just have to learn a little rule set that's slightly different from multiplayer in order to deal with the cards. But other than that, building your little farm works identically to a multiplayer game. And so you can get that cool thematic fun from a solo mode as well as a multiplayer experience. Now granted, you know, the player counts are doing to change up this game quite dramatically. You're going to feel very different playing a two player than you are a four player game. And we'll get onto more of that in my summary and verdict. But yeah, there's enough here to keep you going for a fair few games. Maybe I wish there was more specialists. I mean, I know there's 15 of them, but you see them in every game. Maybe it would have been cool if you had only so many of them. So in different games, some specialists weren't around. Or maybe it just would be cool to see an expansion at some point where they introduced different card sets, a bit like what they've done with Agricola. You know, they've done the, the beginner, the intermediate, the advanced set, and then they did like the French version and the special farmer version or whatever. You know, they've done all sorts of decks. Could we not do the same here? 
That'd be pretty cool. But it's not the end of the world. There's, there's a, enough variety here to keep you going. So in summary, Glass Road has definitely done the job of appealing to me a bit more than it used to. Because remember, I thought it was overrated at first, but this was six years ago. Tastes change, people's perceptions on games change. And bear in mind, I only played it with four players. And I still hold that four players for this game just doesn't work well enough. It's not bad. I mean, I thought it was pretty bad in the past. Now I just think it's kind of average, above average, as a four-player game. But when I played this with three, two, and one, the game clicked. It sung to me. It just worked. I liked it. It, it just had... It had the cool thinkiness of deciding what cards to play and the fun thematic nature of building up a little farm, but it didn't feel entirely chaotic or too random, and I think that's what 4Player did. But that kind of makes this one a little bit of a hard one to rate, because I think it's produced brilliantly, I think it's got great aesthetic production, I think the ease of play is solid, I think the duration's pretty good, I mean you're talking 60 to 90 minutes for a game once you know what you're doing, again, excluding 4Players, but having a solo mode as well is good, decent amount of longevity, you know, very thinky tactics. It's a really cool game, but 4 player really does suck a bit for me, but then 3, 2 and 1 really is good for me. So how do I rate this? Do I come up with one rating as a whole? Do I emphasize the fact that I'm playing this more with 1, 2 or 3 players rather than 4? I know I do the whole player rating on these cert verdicts, but... Still, that makes this one quite an interesting one to do. In the past, I think I would have rated Glass Road a 6 out of 10 overall. There was stuff I could see that was good about it, but the 4-player game really just soured my nature of it. But like I say, that was 6 years ago, and that was all I played it as. I didn't review it that long ago, that was just first impressions. I am glad though that I've been able to give Glass Road the, like, the, 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 the attention it deserves. And I'm pleased to say, it's won me over. It's staying in the collection, and honestly, there's a lot more good things to say about this game than bad. And even then, that's subjective. Four players might be great for you. Maybe you want a little bit of that chaos. Maybe you just want that little bit of tension of like, oh, there's a good chance this won't work. I've got to work my way around it. If so, then fantastic. There's pretty much nothing else negative to say about this game. I'm definitely going with the caveat that four players, just for me, doesn't work. But 3, 2, and 1 is so solid with everything else that's good about this game. I'm going to give this the credit it deserves and bump this just slightly up to a 9 out of 10. I'm giving this a distinction seal here because a lot of good things are here. I love the tactic and strategy that's incorporated with a 2 or 3 player game. It's a fun solo experience. But I do think that rating would drop to something like a 6 out of 10, at most a 7 out of 10, if you're talking a 4 player experience, particularly if anyone's prone to analysis paralysis. Analysis. It's one of those where the player count makes such a drastic difference for me that I gotta put that caveat in. But overall, I think, you know, if you like the four player setup, then by all means you're gonna love this. For me, I'm gonna play this predominantly as a solo two or three player game, and when I do so, it's a 9 out of 10. Other games that I've given a distinction seal to are not perfect. They've got player counts I don't want to play it as. I mean, I don't often play Sentinels in the Multiverse at 5 player, for example. But I'll happily play it at 3 and 4 and 2 player. So do I give that not a 10 out of 10 because I don't like 5 player that much? No. Every game has its flaws. 4 player is my flaw for Glass Road. Otherwise, though, brilliant game. So that's it for me on this episode of The Broken Meeple. If you like what you see, please remember to leave a thumbs up and a comment. Let me know your thoughts about Glass Road. Have you been playing it for ages? Do you like the four-player system? Do you play it solo? Would you like to see it expanded? Are you pleased to see it come back in the print? Let me know your thoughts. I want to engage with you on a personal level. And of course, if you want to help the channel a little bit further, the Patreon campaign is always running if you want to donate a dollar or two each month just to keep the funds going. Until next time, you can check out more content on the channel, including a review review I did for Messina, which is a big Euro game coming from SNN. Oh well, why don't we do another SN game? Why don't we check out Gollum as well? Big, heavy Euro game straight out of Essen that might take your fancy if you want something more thinky than Glass Road. Take care, and remember as always, it's only a game. Bye for now everyone.